on this episode of China Unscripted, a North Korean defector tells us what life was like there, and why South Korea wants to be more like North Korea, and what lessons America can learn. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Jung. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Yongmi Park, a North Korean defector, author, and host of a new YouTube channel, Voice of North Korea. Yongmi, thanks for joining us. Hi, good to be on your show again. No, oh, definitely, definitely. I feel the same way. So, speaking of shows, you have started an amazing new YouTube channel uh, about your experiences in North Korea. And the channel is really blowing up. And I noticed your most popular video is about daily life in North Korea.、Mm -hmm. Why do you think、mm -hmm. people are so fascinated by North Korea? I think that is the least told story in the West, right?、Mm. Uh, there are so many stories about Kim Jong Un's haircut, you know, how he loves Swiss cheese, or how many new missiles North Korea has. Wait, he loves But... Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. That's why it's supposedly very big. I'm not sure. It's all the cheese that's horrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> he was studying in Switzerland, and he developed his love for sweet cheese. Then, huh? Of all the things to fall in love with in Switzerland, the cheese. <laughs> not not the freedom or the democracy, but the cheese. Well, the chocolate. Oh, the chocolate. Yeah. Skiing. I don't know. Yeah.、So, anyway, sorry. Continue. <laughs> So I think people usually really want to know, right? That what is how the North Korean people are living in that darkness. It was really random video. So many people just asking, "Can you just tell me about your daily life in North Korea?" So you know, I was just really just quickly told how we lived, and people just found so much. I think you know, inspiration. Also, they they felt really related to North Korean people in that way, <laughs> even <laughs> though it's a very different like universe. Or maybe they were shocked. I don't know why that video got so many views, even though it wasn't most like sensational thing at all. It was. I mean, I was doing the videos.、So、it's gonna be very boring for people to watch this. <laughs>、mm -hmm. Well, well, yeah. I mean, it was interesting because it wasn't. I know you did an,、uh, an episode about you know Kim Jong Un's Pleasure Squad, which obviously did well as well. But it was still like the the, the daily life. Like, well, I, I'm curious, what is the daily life like in North Korea? North Korea, even though it began with this ideology of let let's all be equal, right? They they claim themselves socialist paradise. However, it is the most unequal society that I've ever seen in my lifetime. I've been to a lot of countries, but it is that is her irony about this. They began saying like let's be equal, but you know the leader became a god, and the people who served him became slaves. And do not even know what human rights is. Well, so everyone is equal. All the people are slaves, and the gods are gods. Right. I mean, in that way, they did a perfect job creating that dystopia. Like North Korea regime's standard of success is actually keeping ten percent of the population. That's their like standard of success. If ninety percent of them dying from starvation, they still think of it as a great success. And that's why they do do not get bothered by you know sixty percent of people are malnourished and battling with starvation every day in the rest of the capital outside of the capital. Therefore, the daily life really different between the people in the capital, between the people in the government of official positions, and also the most in the bottom class. Well, sounds like Kim Jong Un is keeping all the Swiss cheese to himself. Yeah. When he came onto the power in 2011, after Kim Jong Un passed away, he wasn't that big, but he just can't control how much he got, and he just consumes too much by himself. It's probably stress eating, you know, all the pressures of being supreme leader. How is it stressful? His the bar at 10 percent of the population, like that bar is so well, low. I mean, you got to keep purging. That, you know, you 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 don't want to kill your uncles、yeah. and you know. Shelly, if he、things. were purging, he'd be a lot skinnier. Let me tell you that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Yes. Believe me, it jokes. Uh, um. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I think North Korea is kind of like this black box, and so yeah, I can see why people would be kind of fascinated to like kind of see through the veil and 
And I think your channel kind of does that. Yeah. And I think that's really important because, you know, we focus so much on the military, but not on the actual well-being of people there or lack of well-being, I guess you could say. So you're you're really bringing that to the forefront and also in an entertaining way, which is great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's what I've been trying my best to letting the people know how, you know, average people living there. Because, I mean, when we look at the, learn the history, right, we learn about a lot of kings and queens. So I get that the natural tendency for the traditional media to cover the king, <laughs> Kim Jong-un all the time, or the how the top, you know, government works. But the thing, I think generally, we cannot really relate to King's life that much, right? We can relate to more with the general population life. And I think that has been the least report in Western media, at least, you know, the North Korean's lives in general. Can you give us like a, an example, a short story from your life when you were in North Korea that kind of represents what life is like? You know, I was, I mean, I wasn't born into North Korean standard of poverty, <laughs> the middle class, and I can give you what the middle class life looks like. Well, like middle class when you're born, it is the, like the same, the, your life is already determined for you, depending on your, sta your parents, grandparents' status in the party. So depending on what your great great parents did during the Korean War or before the Japanese colonization, they assign you to different status in the birth class. I know it's like socialists, but they do have classes. And North Korea separated people into three big categories, like the royal, middle, and the you know, hostile. But between these three classes, they divided you into 50 different classes. Hmm. And generally people know they are in the middle or bottom, but they don't know exactly which 50 different class they are in. This is a very high classified information. So usually you get to know it when you try to join the party or get a job or university, they let you know when you get married, you can get to know that. So when I was born, I was, I knew kind of I was in the middle and therefore I wouldn't dream of, you know, because going to a top university or becoming a prominent person. I just knew if I were lucky, I wouldn't get exiled to the countryside and be a farmer. But when I say farmer, right, in America, a lot of farmers are actually rich. <laughs> but in North Korea, farmer means you are working at this collective farm. And the government takes 80% the, the harvest. And that 20%, they give it to the officials to give it to the other people the, who worked for the farm for a year. But then this of, official, there's so much corruption, they do not give even this 20% and dividing to the other farmers. Usually they take that most of it and the farmers do not get anything. So in the winter time, the usually farmers die and they don't survive till the spring. So being a farmer means like really finer call for you in North Korea. I knew I wasn't going to be a farmer. I, I thought if I did my best, I could have been in the city and somehow being in the black market where my father was working in. I didn't go to school like everybody else, but even though in name is a free education, but it's not free because nothing governments do not provide anything. So school teachers have to survive and only way they can survive is getting the bribes from the students. So if the students do not bribe the teachers and bring things to them, they would not let us to be in the sitting in the classroom and hit us and kick us back to the home to bring things to them. And I couldn't afford to go to school after one or two years. So I didn't really have much education. And most of North Korean kids do not get education because when you go to school, the things you learn is like, of course, all about hating enemies, not about Big Bang, not about Shakespeare. None of that is all about brainwashing us and making us, you know, to be even dumber than we originally are. And the home at home, there are so many thieves. So parents can't afford to send their children to school and we usually become like what they say, dogs, human dogs. We stay at home and, you know, go to river because we don't have running water. So children have to go to get the water to home and like chop the woods or cleaning while parents go work in the black market to find food. And this is for the middle class. Yeah, that is middle class. But bottom class is like, is unthinkable. Wow. Uh, yeah, that is, that's definitely not the middle class in the U.S., <laughs> yeah, but so the fact that 
at some point, people like the. This is the thing. A lot of North Korean people they escape. They don't know how. Like we don't. They don't know what, like where the means. They never seen it. So the fact they ate three times a day and they were not eating meat or anything. They had the grains and some kimchi cabbage. They thought they had an unbelievable wealthy life, and they say, "Oh, we were all rich in North Korea." And like, do you know like? Wealthy means you need to have a car at least, or maybe some kind of motorcycle. You need to go vacation once a year. Like that means wealthy in this country, and they then like, oh, that's like something we couldn't even dream of. Wait, I don't have a car or a motorcycle or ever take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> you don't? Okay, so that's a you're not middle class then. Oh, that's gosh. what I read actually. <laughs> the to define American middle class, they say each household has like. At least one transportation, blah, maybe vacation, something like that. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned the free education in North Korea is not free, but here in the U.S. we have student loans. Yeah. Well, and so this is something like I've known you for a few years now, and I'm always amazed. Like it was such a challenging life you've led, but you are far more chipper and happy than the average New Yorker. We live a life of misery and drudgery. <laughs> How do you yeah, do funny. it? How do I do it? Uh, I mean, it's not like I don't have bad days. And also, like, my job is pretty stressful because, you know, the dictator trying to kill me all the time. So, you know, I have so many hacking threats, security threats. So, Wait, the dictator's trying to kill you all the time? Yeah, I mean... I think, but I guess it's the perspective, right? I, I came so far. The fact that I can't even talk about trauma is definitely a first world problem that I got now. So, you know, just keeping the perspective back and think how little I had and how I, far I came. So even if I get cared, I really do not have complaints. Like the only thing that I want for my father who died when he was like 45 was that I just wish that he just even one day seen this free world, that he knew that this kind of the life exists for humans. That's all I hoped. Not even, not even like him living in freedom for one year. Just like, I wish he knew that. But a lot of North Koreans, actually most of them, do not even know life can be this free. Life can be this good. So the fact that I actually lived it and seen it, this is like more than enough for me. Well, so then this is, this raises an interesting question because in the U.S., for instance, more and more young people are find are are interested in socialism or communism, and I know South Korea is actually getting closer to North Korea. Yeah. The, the the president has recently, uh, well, the legislative has actually enacted laws that says you can't uh, send leaflets into North Korea. What what do you make of this sort of global shift to? socialism and communism considering like you you have lived it i think not all the liberal but like not in the middle but extreme liberalism where you care about even like in america talking about pronouns right the importance of pronouns all those things is like something you can care about when you are in a like comfortable state during the war during the poverty you can never who cares about pronouns right your survival is on the line who cares nobody cares I think that's the thing, like, that's what I learned about being in freedom and learning about this new world that, you know, not having problem is a problem. Hmm. And we've been in a peaceful state, in a comfortable world with the wealth that free market generated and healthy democracy really got rid of a lot of problems that our ancestors had to deal with, right? They had tools, they don't have dentists, right? They don't have running water, electricity there. Their life was so hard, and now this technology got rid of so much problem for us. And in a way, I think people just lost, and they just have to care about something, and they do not find meaning in the a lot of things. And I think that's why I see so much these people angry suddenly. Right? I went to Columbia University in New York for the last four years, and as I know, people are very grumpy, and so many of them going to therapy. I couldn't believe, like, you guys living in the best city in the world. And, like, how are you miserable, right? I couldn't understand as a North Korean, but living there for a long time really helped me to understand why I think it, 
they just they, uh, because they don't have any comparison, right? All their life, they what they have seen is this comfort and good, and everything was good, and they somehow trying to use their I don't know fighting spirit on something, but they found the wrong cause, I think. This leads to an interesting question. Like, North Korea today is absolutely insane. How does a society become that? Yeah, it, it becomes when people stay silent for in the fear of their life, right? North Korea began as a communist and when after the World War II ended and Japan left, then Korea became independent and Kim Il-sung, with the support of Soviet Union and China, came in and promised to the peasant that we are going to get rid of the landowners, we are going to get rid of the business owners, we are going to give you the power to the people so you can be in your charge. And as long as you give all your rights and problems, burdens on our shoulder, the party, the Communist Party of North Korea, we will take care of that for you. But during that process, the people who disagreed with the, with the government taking care of so much problem, and those people got, of course, get killed, but not only them. The problem that, like, we were talking about South Korea before, the Moon Jae-in, they were the, all the branches of the people who were fighting against Don Duan, the authoritarian president in South Korea had before. But the thing is that South Korea, does, in free democracy, right, we don't kill people because their grandpa did something. But North Korea, what they do is that if a person shows any kind of resistance to the system, they just not only even like kill three generations, they kill the in-laws of the in-laws and in-laws, like something, there's one person who escaped to South Korea, like when Jang Song Tak, right, the uncle, Kim Jong-un killed. They killed more than 10,000 people for him. Oh. Anyone remotely close to him, they didn't even know that they were close to him, actually. And that's how North Korea get rid of the tiniest seed that can grow to fight back. So they use this like merciless called like zero tolerance, like zero tolerance. And in the beginning, they were killing everybody who resisted, including their grandchildren and their future, like even relatives. And also, I think I blame my grandparents' generation for that. Despite that, I still believe they should have fought, but they are not. But the thing is, how can we blame North Korean, like my grandparents' generation? Look at us right now. We are being, being censored by these big tech companies. But like, actually, how many people are fighting, right? Like our freedom in South Korea or America gets taken away every day, but people are okay with that. So... It's way less gradual what happened to North Koreans, but I think that's what really did that that terror of completely like eliminating you if you disagree even slightly and even your children's future. That made it into North Korea now, right now, to the point where people don't even know they are slaves. They don't even know they are oppressed. They don't even know how many countries in the world exist. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Youngmi, but I think some of the things, the critical things you said about big tech violate YouTube community guidelines. So I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, just shut down this interview right now and uh, <laughs> ban your channel. Uh, this uh, We can't. can't ha carry have on. you gotten in U trouble with YouTube for anything on your oh, channel? Yeah. Um, oh, my God. You have. I did not know the. Ex I never knew they were going to like actually silence me. Like I was a slave, I was bought for like 20 less than $300, I more like call a person, right? Like I meet a lot of criteria that the victim who they talk about in the pyramid, I'm pretty there. <laughs> I never knew that they would come after me, but the videos when I talk about, when that I talked about, like imagine if like 60% of the Hong Kong population had guns this time, China wouldn't take over that easily, right? Without any fight, like there, it was like at least battered, to win they had, right? Because they had, there were no guns. And I was thinking, imagine if North Koreans had guns. Like, not Kim Jong-un, the citizens. I mean, North Korea, even though they say they can get rid of 90% of the population, but if 90% people have guns, they cannot ever take them like that. So I, I was talking about my view on the Second Amendment. 
And of course, it was banned. And I talk about the Me Too that is happening in North Korea under North Korean dictatorship. So they encourage people to talk about right being raped by white men in America, but they don't want us to talk about how women are raped by another communist and socialist in North Korea. They censored the Me Too content? Yeah, Me Too. I mean, it wasn't even, and also, of course, like the plight of North women in China. I talked mm-hmm. about how, right, like no, 300,000 North Korean women right now in China, and like 80, 90% of them are being trafficked. And Michelle Obama has no problem standing up for those Boko Haram girls, for the girls who were like kidnapped by Taliban. They don't have problem, but as long as we ask them to stand up for something against CCP in China, they don't. So I talked about, I didn't even talk about Michelle Obama. I just talked about just like plight of Korean women in China, how they are being sold and how this is completely going against Geneva Convention and silenced by international community. Of course, that gets banned because I'm criticizing China's Communist Party. Right. I mean, and you also have your own experience fleeing to China and like everything that women there experience, you basically, I mean, because you talked about that in, in the, the an interview you did with us a couple of years ago. It's not like just your opinion. It's they're actually silencing your life story. Yeah. It's so, it's- Also, the thing is, like, I don't even care they are silencing my story. They don't have to take my story seriously. But this was actually conducted by the UN COI report in 2013. The UN is most, like, least, you know, like, like, liberal, I mean, in a way, the classical liberal term. They came to this conclusion with under Obama and Stan and the power. They concluded about this plight of women in China by North Korean women. And also what is happening in North Korea, they say, the only resemblance we can find in our history is Nazi Germany and Stalin's concentration camps. So they definitely said, like, what is happening in North Korea is a Holocaust. It's repeating now. But that was their words. It's not my words. I'm claiming that. But even that is now too, I guess, too maybe offensive or maybe too much hate speech it became now. So the things were okay under Obama now, so it's not okay. I mean, I have to like ask how how are North Korean defectors um, treated in places like South Korea or like when you when you finally escape North Korea, like what are what are the lives like for people like that? Right, like when we escape, like ninety nine percent of us are going to China, and as I talked about before, the Chinese regime do not respect human rights. And they catch us and send us back to North Korea, uh, even though we are going to be executed and sent to prison camp and tortured. That is the crime against humanity by also the UN Human Rights Declaration. And therefore, most of the defectors are also women. And 80, 90% of them do get trafficked in China. But once the one, the Rokians who survive China and make it to South Korea, then there's another systemic racism against North Koreans that, you know, saying they can be a spy. Right now, like, like Moon Jae-in, right, the South Koreans have freedom of speech, but we don't because we are, no, we are North Korean-born people. So even though we have South Korean citizenship, we cannot send the balloons to the North, even though it is protected of, you know, in the South Korean constitution. I was going to ask about the, the, the leaflet thing because... When even when I was reading about the situation in like American media, um, they kind of made it seem like, eh, like nobody really cares about these leaflets anyway. <laughs> like they're kind of stupid. Like they don't really change anybody's mind. They actually endanger people in South Korea because what if North Korea gets like pissed off that you know people are sending leaflets mm-hmm. over, even though they've been doing it for you know decades and decades. It's they're like, okay, this is actually just like the moon administration like the legislature like looking out for you know the safety of south koreans uh like i was kind of stunned that like this was the way that they were talking about it is is that accurate as in terms of like how people feel about like being able to send those leaflets over or like is it is it like do north koreans feel like that's a stupid thing I'm so glad you asked the question now the rhetoric of north korea like i mean when the even American media write about North Korea. They get the sources from South Korea. They get the South Korea view on things. So even like reading about North, I mean New York Times, I sometimes wonder like, is this like North Korean like 
propaganda channel wrote this or like who wrote this thing in America, right? And like that's like how bad New York Times is reporting on North Korea. So the thing is that if leaflets do not threat Kim Jong Un's throne and do not change anyone's minds, why Kim Jong Un is willing to going to a war with South Korea on that? Because this is so so crucially affecting him. That North Koreans through leaflets learning the truth about the rest of the world, and actually a lot of people escaped after picking up, they're getting these radios or picking up these leaflets. A lot of defectors did that. So North Korea, you know, this is actually changing a lot of North Koreans' minds and freeing them. Therefore, they demanded the South Korea to shut it down. When before Moon Jae-in, the Park Geun the women president who got impeached, when she became the president. The first thing she did was, as a conservative president, were starting that huge uh, speakerphone, the DMZ, to blaring this like freedom of news and music to the north. And North Korea got really upset. Well, what can do? South Korea was saying like, this is our right to do this, and they couldn't do anything. Even though they said we're gonna start the war over this, of course, it's all about rhetoric, right? North Korea says like they are gonna make into America into sea of fires. And they still haven't like bombed us yet. So, of course, like South Korea, if they want to go with the rhetoric, it is true that Kim Jong Un said, "I'm gonna start the war if you don't stop this." But does that mean like Kim Jong Un or North Korea did that once? They've been saying that until like since the beginning of North Korea to North South Koreans. What I'm saying is that Moon Jae-in just using this like rhetoric and twisting the meaning and trying to do what is pleasing to Kim Jong Un and Kim Yo Jong. Why is he doing that? Because he his lifetime mission is making Korean Peninsula unified under under North Korean rule. Under North Korean rule. So they don't say that on on surface, right? But when you say peace and unification, it sounds so wonderful. Who don't want the peace and unification? What North Korea always wanted is that why don't we we have the Unified Korea, but let's do one day we all gather your parties and our party north and gather. Let's do the election, free election. Then let's see which party get chosen, like North Korea's Communist Party or like Minjudang, like two parties and main parties in South Korea. Then if the more party choose us, then like that party gonna be the ruler of entire Korean Peninsula. But the thing is also, it was not actual free. I mean, North Korea says that every year there's like free election, right? So North Korean people, they do not have a choice other than like selecting Communist Party. Otherwise, they're going to be executed and there's nobody else on the ballot. They have to choose their own North Korean Communist Party. And South Korea is so divided. There are like more than 12 parties each time and there's election coming up. So if they're going to go this like choosing the party thing, of course, North Korea is going to win. Well, also, I mean, considering that there's been allegations that the last uh, legislative election in April was rigged, that there was uh, voting machines with Huawei parts. In South Korea. In well, South made, Korea. Made by Huawei. Made, yeah. 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 I wonder how that election would go. It's not a free election. It's election free. Mm. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, this is what is shocking for me, too. Like, I almost think like maybe whenever I go, I bring dictatorship, you know? <laughs> it's your fault. I know. It's like maybe I'm not in a faith to live in a free, like free market, like free world. Maybe wherever I go, I have to fight to be free somehow. So I went to South Korea. It became unfree. And I came to America and we were see it's going to stay free or not. <laughs> have you considered moving to Canada? Mm. <laughs> No, I don't think I want to be under Justin Trudeau for sure. No, he is the biggest hypocrite I've ever seen as a politician. And also the thing is that I don't know exactly that he does everything with my Canada, but when his policy towards dealing with North Korean defectors in Canada and South Korea and China, he's definitely not the, I mean, maybe after him, maybe I might consider, but not now. <laughs> Oh, geez, oh, wow. this is really kind of depressing. I mean, and she's so chipper. Yeah. Well, I was gonna, you know, the the leaflet thing kind of fascinates me too because 
I mean, it's not really just about leaflets. It also applies to like other things that you can send across the border, right? Like um, USB drives and things like that. And you were involved with like the Human Rights Foundation and doing this like flash drives for freedom thing where people would like donate, you know, these USB drives and then they would be loaded up with like news about the world and whatever and sent to North Korea. So is that now illegal under the South, like the South Korean law? Yeah, so they said balloon launches and other like human rights, North Korean human rights related activities. So some parts is very un, not vague. And then that's the scary part. Like when the laws are not as specific, they can actually get a lot of pe people. And there's like loopholes, but then also you can get tricked easily. And I mean, the thing is like the imprisoning the activists, North Korean de facto activists in South Korea is not the first time thing. Those people who has been doing the balloon launch, they've been in prison many, many, many times already. The North Koreans in South Korea? Oh, yes, yes. So when I was actually doing the launches with them, because the South Korean authorities said they're going to imprison us, we had to do it secretly. And then did the later, like, do the press, like, release that we actually done the launching but now they say the the sentence is like up to three years and the fines are twenty seven thousand usd if we get caught by doing it wow <laughs> so i mean like though sometimes the murderers and rapists don't even go to jail for five years in south korea and sending some leaflets with the ideas of truth and freedom is going to jail for that amount it's just unthinkable in free democracy they can do this and like that quickly, like, right? Like we say that freedom is never one generation away. And, and I, I'm learning that how quickly this freedom is so fragile and it can fall. I mean, even when you and Matt went to, um, Chris, when we, you guys went to South Korea, and what year was that? 2016. That's right. Uh, so Park was still the president. Mm. And, yep, those yeah. good times. <laughs> it's gone. So so really just in, in that it's been now almost five years since we were in South Korea. And just in that time it's the democracy has deteriorated that much. It's been so much. So right now, as you said, right, like you share told me about that reporting that they have to do in South Korea. Like in the the shows that I used to be on in South Korea, like they were owned by conservative uh groups. And we were able to talk about Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Un without like a uh, honorific like title. Like, can you imagine like if we on the TV shows we have to call like Mr. Hitler, like the respected. We would never do that, right? If that if you're gonna be in trouble. But right now, in South Korea, on any publication, you have to use honorific term to respect Kim Jong Un. Really? Wait, so the, the yes. The South Korean government mandates how the media are and are not allowed to refer to a foreign dictator? They don't explicitly, like, publicly say, but there's so much pressure in the behind the scene, the, the blue house in, in South Korea. So actually, I have uh, other defectors even in America, and they are trying to find asylum in America from South Korea. And their lawyers tell them, actually in South Korea, do not talk about anything bad about Moon. So you might, they, they would like claim you something and bring you back to South Korea, and you might not even get the immigrant status in America. So wow. I would actually, I just heard that yesterday, and my fellow defector said I cannot talk about Moon that way because like my immigration status is going to like get affected. And my lawyer told him not to do the influence that Moon reaches in the behind the scene and preventing people to criticize him. I also have to talk about this. Like when Moon got elected, I wrote an op-ed with Thor Harrison from the Human Rights Foundation about the Moon's past with the communist. He was playing with his communist ideology and supporting the ideology in the behind the past. I wanted to warn him that why I just want you to do the right thing right now because now you're the president. Then South Korean counselor reached out to me in New York and asked to have a like, you know, meal with them. And once I sat down, like, you know, like, why would you criticize our president that way in the like Wall Street Journal, like in the international publication? Like, we definitely do not appreciate it and blah, 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 you know. So 
Even like I left South Korea being in America as a South Korean citizen, talking about him is not okay. It's like a very different way of censorship. But like, imagine if I didn't, I if I was not gonna get a U.S. citizenship here in a few months, then I would be also scared to talk about anything because they can actually imprison me when I go back to South Korea. Well, that's crazy. And one of the things I understand about uh, South Korean libel law is that if you say, correct me if I'm wrong here, but if you say something about a, an elected official that is, you know, causes them damages, uh, they can sue you. Even if what you say is true, they can still sue you. So truth is not actually a defense. Is that is that accurate? If there's some, I actually don't know exactly about it. I heard that before, but I have to look into the law more precisely. It's like, cause that's a very controversial law. And each party like talks about it very differently. So, but either way, if you do criticize the president Moon Jae In, uh, he will, in one way or another, go after you. I mean, it is pretty scary that like the South Korean consulate would go. You can't take do you, that. invite you to tea, <laughs> basically. Wow. Yeah. 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 Gosh, imagine an American living in like the UK or something, and then that that American says something bad about President Trump, yeah. right? Like, I can't imagine Trump or Obama or any U.S. president sending a consular official to go talk with that person and tell them, please don't criticize the president. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, like, that's insane to me. And yet that's actually what happened to you. I mean, I just, yeah. that shocks me. Well, I guess that's the interesting thing. Like, how I asked you earlier, how does a society become like North Korea? And I guess this is something we need to all watch out it's, for in it's our democracy. Because you, you vote someone into power who shares that ideology and then gradually shifts the Well, the it's legal also system. that you, like based on what you were saying, Yomi, a lot of it is you give up your own power and you give it to an authority figure. You give it to the government or whoever who promises to take care of you. And then yeah. they do take care of you. Oh, I see. You know, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, like, they all come in and say, oh, I'm going to make the college, you know, the tuition debt free, I'm going to make the free health care, I'm going to make you live long, happy, I'm going to take care of everything, so why don't you give me all this right to me? And that's where, how it begins, right, with all these wonderful promises of utopia, and what they deliver is the hell, the living hell that we haven't ever seen here in this freedom. Well, totally separate from that, I, you know, small businesses in the U.S. may be dying, but I'm looking forward to that stimulus check. Uh, <laughs> you know. I, uh, huh? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know, like, the thing is, like, right now in America, too, I have North Korean defector fellow friends in Chicago, other parts, and they don't, you know, they don't have family and they don't have education. They don't even speak English a lot of times, right? They come here as an adult. You cannot compete. You cannot go become a, you know, computer programmer while you can't even, like, have a basic conversation in English. And often they work as a nail salon, as a manicure person or eyelash extensioner or food delivery. Food delivery is okay. But the, these girls are in trouble. They usually do the eyelash extension and beauty sounds all closed. Mm. Mm. And I know in America, they are in the in, in this unbelievable poverty. But the, the good thing about North Koreans, they have like their expectation of good life is very low. So even though they get paid like 13 hours an hour, but like only work like a few hours during the week, they still don't complain. They still think America is the best country in the world. So I'm like, <laughs> whenever I'm meeting Americans and complaining so much and like meeting North Koreans, it's just so refreshing. Is Are there a lot of North Koreans living in the U.S.? Not that many. Officially, there are only 209. So mm -hmm. in that, no wonder why you don't get to meet a lot of North Koreans, Chris. <laughs> That's true. But <laughs> they are like more gathered in a certain states, like Washington, D.C., Hmm. LA, Chicago, like New York, I think it's too expensive and San Francisco is too expensive for them. But they generally find a place where it has more bigger Korean population. So in Chicago, as far as I know, it's over 10. And they say this is like the most gathered place they know in America that 
So yeah, more than 10 North Koreans is pretty much that you can ever see anywhere in the world. Other than South Korea, I mean. Mm -hmm. Is there anything people can do about this? Like what's happening to the North Koreans in South Korea? Like this, this, is there any way to turn that around? I'm not sure about South Korea <laughs> because... The, the, the thing about that I have still confidence in America right now, right? Like the people don't like San Francisco, LA, like New York, they go to Florida, right? They go to Texas. You would be very popular in Texas. I want to go to With what you Texas. say about guns. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Their values do align with a lot of things that I care about. So I cannot believe I'm in Chicago. It's so miserable here. It's just unbelievable. They, during this lockdown, during the summertime, right? They say because of COVID restrictions, you cannot go to beach. I mean, like we have a huge lake, so there's a beach. So if you are poor, you cannot walk on the beach and like get in the water. But if you are rich, you can have a, your yacht. So these are these tons of rich people are bringing their boats and yacht and this, and there's no social distancing for them. They are playing speakerphone and music and having parties all summer through. And the wow. rather poor people, because we have to do quarantine, so we cannot even touch the water. And I have a son who wanna go in the beach and we get kicked out. And these people yelling and so angry, right? But like, it's why are these rich people in a yacht and having so much party in the water and that is allowed. You know, and like considering how like it's been so hard on, the, the coronavirus has like really created more of a divide between the rich and the poor in the US. Uh, you know, students from poor families can't afford the tutors to help with. Uh, we d you did an episode about this, Matt, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, and it just just seems like a like a grim reflection of like a country like North Korea, where there's like this becomes this elite class that is yeah. has has all the rights and all the freedoms, and everyone else is placed by not not all animals are created equal. What how does that go? No, all, no. all animals are equal, but some are, are more, more equal, equal than, than others. others. I like That's how right. you you confused Animal Farm with the Declaration <laughs> of Independence. <laughs> yeah, but Four I, scores and seven years ago, our is, pigs. I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I I think like I do believe that there's some value in having, you know, a wealth gap because there's an ability for people to be upwardly mobile. But the challenge is that when the elite class kind of uses their privilege to suppress other people's economic freedom and other freedoms, I think then that becomes a real problem. And the reason that's relevant to what you're saying, Yonmi, is that like when a, a group of people is oppressed so much and they feel like they've been, like their economic uh, opportunities have been taken away, then they're a lot more likely to say, well, maybe the government should come in and solve this and yeah. we'll give up some of our freedoms to get, you know, the benefits and, and uh, you know, a stipend from the government or, or, you know, all the different things that come from that. And it seems very appealing when you've lost everything. Although I think that the problem with that is that the government is very much aligned with those same elites who took everything away in the first place. So to put your faith in an all-powerful government maybe is like putting your faith in the same people that took everything away from you in the first place. But, you know, I, I guess, I guess yeah. it's just something to be careful about uh, during this COVID time. I think like that is also made me what made me think is like, of course, in the beginning, I came to America when Trump was running for president with Hillary, right? And of course, I was like one of those people trying my best to fit into this politically correctness. And I mean, Trump is a womanizer. I want Hillary to win. I don't care about the policies. I didn't know much about America. So I was like still hoping Hillary to win. And I will cry when Trump won like four or five years ago. And that's how I was. And I was thinking if I become conservative, I thought like I'm a racist. Something's wrong with me. I have to my best to become these good work people. But then like I was meeting people. I was, I was, because back then I was still like, so like politically correct liberal for them and saying all the right things in their eyes. I was loved by New York Times, especially whenever I was criticizing Trump, they would do all pretty with me. I mean, they don't care about North Korea, but as long as I criticize Trump for them, they want me on their platform. And 
And then I was getting to so many of these places, right? Invited to talks in the biggest companies in the world, meeting celebrities. I mean, meeting even like I was I was meeting even Hillary Clinton. I gave a speech right before her. And it was like that. But the thing, what made me interesting was like, so why every rich person in this country wants her to win? Like, and the people, poor like Uber drivers that I meet, tax drivers, they want Trump to win. Right, it's still the same, right? Every establishment in America, they want Biden to win. The people who are like multi-billionaires and millionaires, they want all him win. And like, if the rich want them to win, there should be some kind of thing, right? That if they don't gain nothing from that, why they want them to win? So people keep thinking like, if you support the Biden, you are like in the class of poor and like you are supporting some kind of revolution. But truth is actually Trump was a revolution. And the poor people actually wanted him to win, right? So, yeah, that's like my story of being coming to realization with my truth and being okay with you know, like what I think. But of course, now I'm never gonna be invited to those parties and people, you know, <laughs> I'm like forever outcasted here. <laughs> I mean, Shelly and Chris, do you guys think we should censor everything she just said? I was just I mean, thinking YouTube is going to shut us down for you this. You know, it's I, really, I know. You know I me, mean? it's for your own good. Like, we don't want you to get in trouble with, you know, like what, what you just said, you know. So you <laughs> should, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, like the the internet should not be a platform for people to express their views. Well, I not think. hate speech, Matt. Definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> Whatever the hate speech yeah. means. <laughs> I mean, look at look at Yonmi. Clearly, a racist person who hates people of color and hates immigrants, just like you, Shelley. That's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't drag me into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling increasingly uncomfortable. <laughs> Are you afraid we're going to get censored for this? I live in fear. Yeah, okay. Come on, you Chris. Need some comfort anymore, like emotional comfort anymore. Like a peacock. Uh, that Wait, would be... you, you peacock. would choose a peacock as be... your comfort animal? Versus what? I don't know. I guess I would go with alpaca. Oh, yeah, that would be you. Alpaca. I don't know. What, what, Yonmi, what's your comfort animal? Oh my god! This is when we turn to therapy on the show. I know, and this was like what I learned at Columbia too. Like before my class, right? Professors email us like in this next week we are gonna read about this, this, and that. In that book, there's some like colonization mindset. Like Jane here, of course, they think she was a colonizer, had the mindset that book is not good to read. I mean, they trash every Western like civilization that books read written. They would give us warnings like, oh, if you feel like triggered, you don't need to come into the class. You don't even really need to read the assignment. And this book's talking about maybe some kind of rape or racism. Don't read it. And in class, I had a baby during that time. I was still nursing my son. So I was asking my professor because my son has like nappy times, right? He would just nap during the, during the lecture time. Some days I was like, can I bring my son? Like, no. Even if he sits, like, no. But there are tons of dogs are running around because they were like comfort animals for the students. So dogs are like licking and barking and going on the table. It's fine for dogs, but bringing a human being is not okay. Wait, people were bringing dogs. People were bringing dogs. Are that we in North happen. Korea now? That did not what? happen when I was in college. No. This is at Columbia University in twenty first century. Yeah. So. I literally had to sit down paying like this fortune to this university to learn about a lot of BS, but while I'm sitting down with dogs in the classroom and they're licking my leg and like doing things. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I love dogs, but it was just so funny that they are okay with dogs, but not okay with actually babies. So your comfort animal is not going to be a dog. No, I think it's going to be a baby. <laughs> Columbia <laughs> University. Again, yeah, they don't allow baby though. So home of the Frankfurt School was that them? That's a that's a rabbit hole for another. Let's yeah, not that's... talk about that. <laughs> we're we're all banned. We're not gonna survive. I kind of didn't expect to end up talking about how America is going, but you know. Wow. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, I mean, it's interesting that your view is that America needs to watch out, like watch out that it's becoming more like South Korea which is becoming more like North Korea. 
Right. So the thing is, like, I mean, in a way that I see in America, it's actually even a bit more. I don't know. Sometimes I have a confidence that America has a 50 different states. You know, if I don't like something, I might even move to Texas someday. But then I also worry about, like, what if all of them, like, become radicalized and become, want to have one central government like North Korea and have a central government economy, everything, right? And also in South Korea, though, it's not like people are not as obsessed with the pronouns. <laughs> People are not as obsessed with the, you know, this comfort anymore. So in some ways, I still, South Korea, even though there's way more censorship, still there's a way more common sense exists. But in America right now, like, it's hard to find common sense, right? Like, it's very hard in Chicago and New York City living there. It's all very, as I said, right, like, people are obsessed with the pronouns. They don't believe that. Gender is such a constructive thing. And, you know, I mean, I don't care about it. If anyone want to be anything, I'm fine with that. But then, like, to the point where I'm so confused, like, what if I feel like someday I'm, like, 15 years old? Can I say that? <laughs> like, I'm 15, right? Like, like, where is the point? And now I'm raising a son. It's a big problem. Like, where do I send him to school? And someday when we were walking across the crosswalk and there was a, like, like, like letting go, right? The green line is go, and it means like white guy, white man looking to walk across. And my son said during the BLM, like white man, and like everyone's looking at him. And I was like, no, James, you cannot talk about that. Like, <laughs> you're like you're white. <laughs> Do you know what that means? And like I don't know if I told you guys, I was robbed in Chicago during the summer. Like it was a violent ro- robbing no. by. Oh wow. Yeah. It was actually in July or August. I was walking with my nanny, my son. My nanny is like Muslim wearing hijab, of course. I'm virtue signaling here too. And I, I like I like all race and religion. But I was walking the Mission Avenue and these three black women pushing me into the marble corner took my wallet out. And it was right during the looting and BLM. So I wouldn't even dare to tell them you're a thief. I said like, I'm not accusing you anything. Can I call the police and can they let them check on you? And they were like hitting me. So I wouldn't like follow them, punching me. But then people saw it and then they were starting to corner me into the corner. Me like the Michigan Avenue saying, you're racist. The color of the person doesn't make them thief. Are you crazy? Why are you doing this? And they would prevent me to call them on the police on them. So they could run away. And of course, they used my credit card to buy $3,000, $4,000 at the Bloomingdale. And Bloomingdale had a footage, so police got them. And they later brought me the video and showed the photos, like, who do you recognize? So I definitely got them. But of course, they are not going to prosecute them because, I mean, they're black. Why do we prosecute, you know, <laughs> Robert robbery? It's, it's not going to happen in Chicago now. And that's when I actually really walk that... Actually, I thought this kind of things happened in Breitbart or some kind of conspiracy theory magazines that like how can people are so crazy in the middle of street Mission Avenue accusing like I'm 80 pounds and these three ladies are huge being punched but still defending those robbers because they are simply black. And I didn't get to be a black person at that point. They lost common sense. Like, you know, even in North Korea, I'm sure if someone beating me, I ask for help, they, they would help me because I'm the weak position in that situation, right? So that's when I thought like, oh my gosh, America is not safe anymore. Like this is not, this is not the country I thought it was going and this is a way uglier than I thought. Because people, I think, are so afraid that they don't do the right thing and they don't purchase the ignoring, right? So I think at the point, people on these bus stations waiting for the buses, I think I'm sure their first instincts is like, I got to show that I'm a, like, I, I love black people and she doesn't look black. So I got to defend black person here. I think that's what they did. Nobody wants to be labeled a counter-revolutionary. Right. Or racist, right. Or Nazi. So it was, I think everyone is trying to survive at that point to show that they were on the side of what is, what is like politically correct right now. And I think that's what I was hurt by, not by like being robbed right i mean asians can be robbers like white people can be murderers like 
why does it matter if these robbers were black or not? Like, I didn't see color. Just happened to be they were African Americans. And what everybody could see at that point was just color. And they were just defending, you know, black people at that point. So, you know, I was like, my nanny was looking at me and she was also scared. They wouldn't like come near me because this white people, they can be very violent. And I think that's when I was thinking, maybe, yeah, we might have even lost that chance to fight back in this country. I don't know actually where this is going to go end up at the end of the day. Maybe Jeez. to the Independent Republic of Texas. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I actually don't mind a lot of states become independent. I I believe in like small states and small governments. So if they want, they should do that before it's too late, I think. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that happen to you. That's an awful story. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. I cross the desert. It doesn't traumatize <laughs> me. I'm not traumatized about anybody. So it just, it was such a refreshing thing. So the tip is never, never fight back and never, you know, if they're like robbers happen to be black, let them go happily and just like thank them, I think. <laughs> I mean, it kind of, I was thinking about knowing a lot of immigrants like uh, who have come to the U.S. and when they talk about things like, Oh, like when Chinese immigrants are like, oh my gosh, it's like the Cultural Revolution. What's happening now? Yeah, and like people are like, you're overreacting. Like that's, you know, that's I think the reaction that a lot of them get that they're like, they're saying like, oh, well, like, you know, that's, how can you compare this to the Cultural Revolution? Like people who are not Chinese are saying this. Like mm -hmm. people who lived through the Cultural Revolution are saying, you know, this kind of reminds me, they're not saying like people are killing people yet or anything like that. They're just saying that like, the fear or like, you know, not being able to say certain things is reminding me of the Cultural Revolution. And then people are like, well, you can't say that. That's not okay. Or um, it reminds me of this article I read in CNN, like right before the election, talking to like Uyghurs about how some of them supported Trump because they felt like he actually was standing up to China on human rights issues. And like the whole article was kind of almost apologizing for them. <laughs> because it, they were like, you know, they had to like, I think also the the Uyghurs themselves felt like they had to specify that like they don't like Trump as a person. You know, it was like they were like, you know, I don't really like how like how rude he is or whatever, but the Trump administration is like doing stuff. Um, and then like the article had to get like a, a different like um, expert who was not Uyghur on like the Uyghur situation to kind of provide balance and say that like you know the trump like they're wrong <laughs> to want the trump administration because you know uh, the trump administration hasn't actually done that much or something like or there was a new york times article about like why um chinese activists support trump like some chinese human rights activists support trump and it was kind of like the whole thing was like these people are weird and they're just listening to disinformation. Like what's the disinformation that's making them feel like that? You know, we can't really criticize the Uyghurs too much because they are being oppressed, but and put in you concentration know, camps. like they're not like, they're kind of wrong though about, you know, it's just like, they want to stand up for victims. Right. But then they end up just talking over them because they feel like they understand like what's best. Like, you know, I know you lived through the cultural revolution, but let me tell you why that you cannot say this is the cultural revolution. You know, it's, yeah. it's I don't know. That, that kind of gets me. Yeah. Well, so, anyway. now this will be our last podcast. Yes. That we yeah. ever do <laughs> before all of our social media gets shut down because we have committed many, many thought crimes. Uh, I apologize to everyone watching. Uh, please purge all of these thoughts you might have had from your brain. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to blame you guys, Matt and Chris. Uh, oh, why? Because you're white guys. Oh, no, that's that's fair. I'm white? Well, okay, Chris is ambiguous. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, here's why I, I take yeah. full responsibility for this. Uh, and I apologize for my. Oh, thanks for taking behavior. my agency away from me, white man. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, young me, I'll see you in Texas. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Do you? I mean, like, oh, I want to definitely move. It's. Uh, 
I hope, yeah. So I just never knew I was ever actually going to censor myself in America. Like, first thing my mom taught me living in North Korea was, you know, don't even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. And I always learned how to censor myself and how not to think certain things. And right, and before I started my own YouTube and I had that awakening, I was like, this is not why I risk my life and crossing desert to be free to censor myself again. But, you know, it's just so unbelievable that like we are censoring ourselves and we are keep saying, oh, we are better than North Korea. We are never going to be that way. But like, guys, like you guys are doing that. You are always censoring yourself in your own brain. Like oh before you say things like it's just like if we are doing that, it just maybe the consequences not as much as probably execution and concentration camp, but losing your jobs now already. Your I mean platforms get shut down, you're censored. It's happening. And people keep saying, like, oh, like as Charlie is that like you're overreacting. You're like sensationalizing this. So I don't know when they're gonna wake up and know this is the beginning of what happened in North Korea. I I don't like this comparison to the U.S. and North Korea. I mean, actually, yeah, it made me think of when I first came to America and I started going to school. My mother told me to never talk about anything at school, like not to tell anybody anything about what happened at home. And like it freaked me out and I didn't understand like uh, why she would. She's like everything that happens at home, you do not tell anybody. When I grew up, I realized that. It was because she lived through the Cultural Revolution um, and, you know, you'd have people watching you all the time and the neighborhood monitors and things like that. And, you know, people denounced their parents and things like like yeah. like it was really bad. So then I was like, oh, well, like, I mean, this is America. You know, why would she be afraid to like, you know, like but now I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, now now I kind of see like, you know, you know, what am I willing to say on Twitter? Like. I censor myself all the time. Like I don't right. talk about certain things. Like, I, like I'm just like okay. I kind of see where she was coming from now. Well, Shelley, I got to tell you, you're being ridiculous by making that kind of comparison. Oh this yeah, is, you're totally hysterical and overreacting. Yeah, I know. It's, uh. <laughs> uh, hey, you're you have a great channel. Everyone watching should subscribe unless it gets shut down by YouTube, unless we get shut down by YouTube. Um, <laughs> you were doing good, Chris. You were going to end this on a positive note. I was. Okay. Everyone subscribe to Young Me's channel. The channel, once again, is Voice of North Korea with Young Me Park. Young Me, thanks. Thanks for being here with us. Yes. Thank you. Uh, again, we'll meet in Texas with our comfort animals and our guns. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a paradise. Could a comfort animal be, be a, a gun? gun? No. <laughs> My comfort animal is called gun. It's a gun. I, yeah, I, I have I have zero interest in guns, but I do like alpacas. So at least I'll take that. Alpacas in the state of Texas. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. thanks, oh. you know, me. Thank you. Take Please care. Take yourself. care, guys. Yeah, you too. Mm. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so. Are we going to be banned for this? I don't know, but it went in a kind of different direction than I was expecting, but it was really interesting. I think we'll be fine. Nobody watches the podcast. Oh, thank oh. goodness. Well, now they have algorithms that can listen to the content of episodes. So even if nobody watches this. The bots are watching. The bots <laughs> are watching. It's like the neighborhood committees. Uh, oh, you're being no. ridiculous. Hysterical, Shelly. You can't, you can't say that, Chris. Can't say what? Hysterical. Why That's not? That's true. Because it's demeaning to women. Oh, because it has it came from like wandering wombs or something? Uh, yeah. yeah. Clearly, Chris, you're not as woke as I am. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I don't know. Did, right. we, did Chris just break? Is that what happened? <laughs> All right. We, we, we should probably wrap. Thanks for watching this episode of China Unscripted. I'm Matt Ganesta. I'm Shelly John. Hi, welcome to America Uncovered. I'm Chris Chappell. Okay, okay, we need to turn Chris off and then back on again, and that'll reboot the system. <laughs> uh, See you next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>